Why does it do that? Oh. Ah, shows them. Last video of the workshop, beer, please. Thank you. Uh, can I stop? So, yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, according to schedule, I have until four, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, this talk is called Fully Understanding the Hashing Trick. This is joint work with Kasper Flexen and Kasper Green Larsen from Aarhus University. Uh, I'm going to start with some motivation, um, real world motivation. So, classification and recommendation system. So, take, for example, uh, Netflix. So, assuming that everybody here is some, at some point of time um, watched a, a Netflix movie. Suppose you watch a Netflix movie, Not Netflix immediately uh, recommends other movies for you, which uh, it considers similar. So how do we decide which movies are similar? So yeah. <laughs> and uh, so as humans, it's very uh, easy. If we were to recommend a movie to a friend, we consider what the movie has, what the movie doesn't have, and all kinds of attributes, but um, yeah, these are called categorical variables. Um, a computer cannot handle these. So how do we transfer these to something a computer can, uh, or an, algor an algorithm can handle? So we take all these characteristics and match them to 0, 1 vector, to bit vectors, which are called uh, feature vectors. Okay, and let's, for the rest of the talk, denote the feature uh, dimension by n. So what happens then? So we have the entire collection of movies that the Netflix server has. This is called the corpus. Uh, so first of all, note that storing the entire corpus, if you have m movies, it takes omega of nm uh, memory. And suppose now Netflix purchases the rights for a new movie, then we need to find the k closest uh, movies to it. That's the k nearest neighbors problem. Um, and comparing two vectors, let's say the L2 distance, it takes linear time. Okay, so how can we make this uh, easier? So uh, one trick is to reduce the dimension. What is what do I mean by uh, dimensionality reduction? So given some epsilon and delta, where epsilon is the approximation, approximation ratio and uh, delta is the error probability, uh, we want a function, okay, we, a, a random function uh, from Rn to Rm, such that for every x and y, the um, L2 distance is approximately preserved. Okay, for this talk you think about n as very large and m as very small. And we want this guarantee. Okay, so the probability of the image, of the distance between the images to be between one plus or minus epsilon, the original distance, is larger than one minus delta. Um, for this talk we will talk uh, about linear projections. Um, yeah, why is that? So aside from the fact that linear is uh, cool. <laughs> uh, it works well under streaming and uh, it is very uh, efficient in practice. Okay, so yeah, so since it's linear, we can um, in, um, put x and y into f like this, since this is a linear operation. And again, since this is a linear operation, we can concentrate on just um, maintaining the L2 norm of one vector. Um, okay, so far everything is clear. So this is a very well-known problem, and it has a very well-known solution, the johnson lindestrass lemma. So uh, this can be achieved with m being um, order of log 1 over delta over epsilon squared. This is known to be optimal. And uh, in most known proofs, the matrix is very, very sparse. OK, usually it's a matrix of independent uh, Gaussians. So um, uh, applying the embedding takes order of mn operations. We want to do this a bit faster than that. So one approach to do that is to try and find sparse matrices that do the same, that um, guarantee the same um, guarantees. So sparse JL by Kane and Nelson, uh, they showed that this is possible to do with the same uh, m, the same dimension, log 1 over delta over epsilon squared, but every column has at most log 1 over delta over epsilon zeros. This means that we can embed much, much faster. Okay, assuming epsilon is small, uh, as epsilons are. Um, and this is almost tight. Okay, so Nguyen and Nelson showed that uh, S has to be at least 
log 1 over delta over epsilon, and there's another log 1 over epsilon uh, factor over there. Okay, so do we have hope to do anything better? So apparently we do. So just to be clear, so far everything is clear? It's clear what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay. So apparently in practice, um, Weinberger et al. at 2009, they um, introduced feature hashing, which is also known as the hashing trick. So uh, the idea is this. You take a vector x and you shuffle it with random signs. What does it mean? So let's assume m is 3, just to uh, contain it in a single slide. So we take each coordinate, each entry of x, we assign it with a random sign and put it in a random back bucket. OK, we continue doing that. I guess the idea is clear by now. OK, and eventually we maintain the sketch. This is the sketch. And surprisingly enough, the norms are the same. But uh, the we want a guarantee with high probability, and of course. Uh, so formally, what does it mean? Uh, we choose a random hash function from n to m, and we choose random signs. These are all independent. And for every x in our n, you can see why I, post I postponed it to a second slide, uh, the ith coordinate, the ith entry of f of x is just the signed sum of all those entries of x that are mapped to the ith bucket. OK, is this clear? If not, think about the image from the previous slide. Uh, this operation is, of course, linear, and moreover, it is as sparse as possible. So every entry of x is only considered once. Uh, but previously, we just said that this cannot guarantee what we want for all vectors. So um, why does it work in practice? Um, yeah. So just a warm up. So let's, uh, let's take a unit vector x and Let's take um, the random variable capital X to be the square norm of the sketch minus the square norm of the uh, original vector. This is one. Just a sanity check to see that you're following. Um, OK, so the expected value of X is 0. And the variance is uh, at most 2 over m. What does this mean? That if I want the uh, probability of maintaining up to 1 plus minus epsilon, the norm of x, how large do I need m to be? That's Chebyshev inequality. We need it to be at least 2 over epsilon squared delta. OK, if you think about epsilon and delta, it's very, very small, especially delta. OK, the epsilon squared in the denominator, apparently we cannot do anything with it. But if you think of delta is very, very small, then this is not too good. OK, this means that I can in fact, preserve norms uh, of every vector, but I need m to be very, very large. OK, so if I increase m by much, I can somehow uh, still get guarantees. OK, the, I mean, the lower bounds uh, we discussed earlier were for the optimal dimension, for m being log 1 over delta over epsilon squared. So if I increase the dimension, I can do much better. But this is uh, too much a cost. And uh, this is more or less the best we can do if we want uh, to guarantee something for all vectors. Because if you think about this vector, I know it's not a unit vector, but putting 1 over square root 2 uh, was less nice. So uh, the, this vector, if, you, if we hash it to uh, m buckets, what is the probability that we maintain the norm? So it's exactly the probability that there, there is no collision. And this probability is 1 over m. So if we want no collision with probability at most, uh, at least 1 over de 1 minus delta, uh, we need m to be at least 1 over delta. So we cannot escape that. OK, are we clear so far? So again, uh, why does it work well in practice? So uh, one parameter which you should uh, pay special attention to is this, the uh, ratio between the infinity norm of x and the L2 norm of x. OK, so this vector has uh, a value of 1 over square root 2 for this parameter. OK? Uh, the infinity norm is just the largest coordinate of x. Um, so what happens if x is more balanced? What happens if the mass of x is not concentrated in very few coordinates? So hopefully, what we want is that if k is large enough, if the number of 
if this balance is very, very small, so every point has very little mass, then everything sort of becomes independent, and by Chernoff and Hofding, we can get what we want. Okay, if x is very, very balanced. And then, uh, okay, so on one hand, if we increase m, then um, we can get our guarantees. On the other hand, if x behaves very nicely, we get also our guarantees. The problem is this is not really true. So it's good as intuition, but um, it's, it doesn't really work. So the Chernoff and Hofting bound do not work. You, you, you are welcome to try this at home. <laughs> um, but as intuition, it serves something. Um, so what is the right trade-off here? So the question is this. So we fix m, epsilon, and delta. So we have a fixed budget for m, and we know exactly how large the error um, can be and how often we allow ourselves to make uh, errors. So we define the uh, new of m, epsilon, and delta to be the maximum new such that if this quotient is smaller than new, then feature hashing works. Okay, and evaluating new uh, basically was open since the original paper by Weinberger et al. Okay, so is the problem clear? Not at least. So again, count sketch with just exactly one. Good question. One in each That's an excellent question. So uh, the the quick answer is yes. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. So. Um, the question was if this isn't just a count sketch with one block of uh, one building block of count sketch. So uh, the, 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 qu the answer is yes, although uh, the perspective is a little bit different. So um, if you think about the feature hashing matrix, okay, with m equals one over epsilon squared, this is exactly count sketch. Okay. And um, the count sketch algorithm repeats this um, mechanism, log one over delta independent times, and gets um, a high concentration probability. So there are two issues with this approach. I mean, it's not a problem, but uh, let's say it's a different perspective of, of uh, things. So here, the effective sparsity eventually is log one over delta over epsilon squared over epsilon. Okay, so you don't get uh, a better uh, bounds for the uh, time it takes to apply the embedding. Another thing is, so when you, have, when you compute the norm of the sketch, you take all these sketches, you compute each of the norms individually, and you compute the median, and you uh, return the median. That's how count sketch works for, to get the high probability bounds. And this is not an embedding uh, to a metric space in RM. In many applications, we need the sketch to be an actual embedding, to actually a, a linear embedding into the, the target K, space. But the K in Nelson is linear, isn't it? Yeah, but as I said, it's, it's I mean, this is much sparser. So Kane and Nelson, uh, the, the matrix uh, constructed by Kane and Nelson has log one over delta over epsilon ones in each column. This has one one in each column. Um, and, and surprisingly enough, it works very well in practice. So, so but is this not just count sketching to more buckets once? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, again, to get, uh, so count sketch is usually in the literature analyzed uh, using first and second moments. So the second moment uh, method that I showed earlier is exactly how, how we analyze uh, count sketch. So, but uh, apparently, count sketch can do much better if you uh, analyze it more carefully. Um, yeah, okay, so our result, uh, uh, so the problem is clear, and just, just to be, I was on, the, on my way to ask you to at least nod <laughs> to see that everything the, is clear. Uh, the NN uh, lower bound that you showed, so that's for a skewed vector, I guess. What, sorry? So you showed us a lower bound, right? That was, uh, yeah. So that's for skewed, I mean. Uh, Four? That's for the vectors which don't, which for which the new is large. Are you trying no. to see that bound? Uh, no. So the, the, there, the, the actually the low bound is on a balanced vector, if I'm not mistaken. So then, are you trying to beat that? How is uh, that low bound? Uh, yeah, but I'm allowing the uh, dimension of the uh, range to increase. 
So their lower bound was if you insist that the dimension is optimal, log 1 over delta over epsilon squared. But I'm allowing the dimension to be larger. OK, so in fact, I'm fixing m, but I am not insisting that m is uh, the optimal. Uh, suppose I have a larger budget and I want to use it. OK? Any more questions? OK. So what we proved is the following. If m is very small, basically smaller than the uh, johnson um, uh dimension, then we can't do anything. OK, we can't walk no matter how small nu is. Uh, if m is larger, as I showed you before, if m is much, much larger, then we can do everything. We can sketch every vector. Uh, and in between these two, um, yeah, this is the right bound. <laughs> so yeah, the Chin said, I think, that epsilon to the two thirds were we was weird. Uh, so yeah, this is the right bound. And th this is tight, so this is the right bound. Um, yeah, it's not our fault. <laughs> this is the right bound. So how do we prove it? So first of all, we take this uh, variable x, which is the difference between the original norm and the new norm. And we uh, prove tight bounds on higher order moments of x. OK? And then we use known concentration bounds, which are, I mean, the concentration bounds that we use are simple. The application is not so simple. This is Markov. This is paley Um These are basically first and second order um, concentration bounds. This is the hard part of the proof. This is just the not so easy part of the proof. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take a few minutes to just show you um, how to uh, expand this. It's going to be a little bit painful, but bear with me. So recall that f of x, the i coordinate, is uh, this um, expression. And let's focus for simplicity. It's going to be hard enough as it is. <laughs> let's focus for simplicity on uh, this balanced vector. The, this is uh, actually the vector on which the uh, lower bound is attained. So this is the hardest vector to map. OK, so uh, if we concentrate on this vector, then this is f of x, the i coordinate. If we square it, then we get, um, just trust me, we get this. So we substitute this, and we get um, this nice thing. <laughs> um, now, we sum over all pairs j and l such that h, uh, j, j and l are mapped to the same bucket. Note that if j is equal l, this is uh, always true. OK, and this happens k times, times 1 over k. We lose the 1 here. And we um, stay with this um, expression. Now we raise it to the rth power. And trust me, you get this thing. <laughs> OK, and then we just take the expectation and use linearity. So we sum over all our sequences of pairs, of distinct pairs. Um, I mean, jp is not equal. is not equal lp for all p. Let's focus on one such uh, sum end. So we take a sequence, and we can think of this sequence as an, a labeled graph. Okay, we can think of every pair as an edge, and these are ordered. But and this can be actually a multigraph, and the same edge can uh, occur several times in the sequence. So one thing you should note first is that this variable and these are independent. So we can uh, split the expectation. Uh, now we just write this differently. So for every uh, j. Sigma j appears how many times? If you think about it as a function of the graph there, it's exactly the degree of the node j in the graph. OK, so this is this. And all these sigma j's are independent, so I can move the expectation back in. Now, what happens if the degree is odd? Zero. The expectation is 0, right? If the degree is even, it's identically 1. This is a degenerate variable, so all nodes must have even degree in order for the sum end to be non-zero. And then we just remain with this expression. Now, how do we analyze this? So think of a graph like this. Uh, first thing you should note is that every connected component, the uh, respective variables are, yeah, I don't know what the, why the middle circle is not there, but they are independent. <coughs> OK, now consider one such connected component. What will it contribute? So 
the expected value of this edge, no, many how, no matter how many times I put it in, and this edge, uh, the, the product is 1 over m squared, because I need all three to be mapped to the same bucket. And in fact, what matters is the number of nodes in each connected component, and not the edges. The edges I don't care about. Um, so every uh, connected component contributes 1 over m to the one, to the one less than the size of the connected component. And this gives us this uh, expression. Uh, it's better to think about it like this. So every, what about a uh, single node? It contributes one here and one here. We can ignore this, and we get that the expected value of uh, the product over there is one over m to the power of number of non-isolated vertices my, minus number of non-degenerate uh, connected components. This means not, I don't count single uh, vertices, isolated vertices here. OK? Is that clear? Yeah. Good. So going back to the higher order moment, uh, we sum over all possible alpha and beta. Um, 1 over m to the alpha minus beta, where g alpha beta is the number of graphs that, actually, that basically satisfy what we discussed here. So they have R labeled edges. They are Eulerian, meaning that every connected component is Eulerian. Um, they have alpha non-isolated vertices and beta non-degenerate connected components. Okay, so the, I mean the, the hard part is to count how many such graphs are there. Okay, so I think Dracula was mentioned before today. <laughs> um, so uh, the theorem we have, we have tight bounds uh, up to 2 to the r factors of the number of such graphs. So if we fix our alpha and beta, uh, g of alpha beta is up to 2 to the r factors, uh, this expression. Okay? Are we good? Are we on the same page? <laughs> I mean, ignore the formula. Just understand. I, I, do you, are you following why we need this? What is r? Yeah, what so r is the number of, uh, of edges. R is the, I raised, I mean, the, this was x to the r. So this is the number of edges here. Okay? So ignore the formula. Are you clear on why we need to count this, uh, these graphs? Okay. Yeah, formulas are not nice here. Um, but as I said, this is tight. So, uh, so obviously you're improving upon Kane and Nelson because they're also doing the counting of these types of graphs. Yeah, so what happens is um, the K Nelson um, approach, since they had log 1 over delta over epsilon 1s, I keep getting back to that. But then you have, um, you can prove uh, concentration by using certain tools. And these tools don't work here since we only have a unique one. So for example, uh, they use a concentration on, on a binomial uh, distributed random variables. So if you have a binomial and you only have one experiment, it's just a Bernoulli experiment, you can't really prove con concentration. Uh, so, so their machinery could not be extended to, to prove uh, bounds for uh, feature hashing. Um, OK. So to prove the upper bound, we show that every graph in this family, I'm abusing notation a little bit. It was a number before, and now it's a set, I know. But we don't need any more notations here, right? Um, so we show that it can be encoded using few bits. Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, OK. Um, so let's just quickly see the idea. Um, so fix some graph, and let these be the non-degenerate connected components in this graph. Take one connected component. For each connected component, we choose arbitrarily a, a tree in that connected component. OK, and we encode these alpha minus beta edges. OK, remember we have beta connected components. Each component has a tree. The sum of the uh, number of edges is alpha minus beta. Each, um, each component contributes one less than the number of nodes. Um, and this can be done using alpha minus beta time two, times 2 log alpha bits. We simply, uh, so we call that the alpha uh, node. So each node can have a log, a log alpha size a label. And we simply uh, encode the edges. OK, now that's a subtle point. 
we choose an extra edge in each connected component, and we know that there is such an edge. Why is that? Well, it's Eulerian, exactly. So we know that the subgraph is Eulerian, and then we know there must be at least one more edge. And this edge can be, in fact, encoded very succinctly. Um, so if we order the connected components by the smallest node, then we know the ordering by now. If you think about decoding later, once we have the trees, we know the ordering. So we can refer to each connected component by its uh, place in this ordering, plus uh, a label within its own edges. OK, and this sums up to be this many bits. And the rest of the edges, we just encode them as elements in this set. OK, and now you have to trust me that this is what you get. Um, yeah, I won't get into that. Um, for the lower bound, I won't get into this at, uh, also, because I'm almost out of time, I think. Uh, but we basically construct a large subfamily of uh, G alpha beta, which is large enough to be this size, up to 2 to the minus r factors. And I think I'll stop here. With the what? The statement of the result. Yeah. Somewhere. Yes. Ah. Yeah, let's leave it at that. <laughs> Sorry. is at the minimum value. Yeah. That means that. You mean here? Right, but if it's like a twice that value, right? OK, yeah, so then, we go back to. Then V is like root epsilon, is it? If M is its order of root epsilon, yeah. Um, wait. I have some log thing. No, it's not. So this is, uh, this is a constant. And I think it's root epsilon log 1 over epsilon, square root of log 1 over epsilon over log 1 over delta, or something like that. They're just substituted here. I'm not sure, actually. And so if I have a? I think it's this. It depends on how epsilon and delta relate to each other. So this uh, is uh, log 1 over epsilon over log 1 over delta. Yeah. And this is just constant over log 1 over delta. So it depends on epsilon and delta. And so then if I have a binary feature vector, then this is saying you need something like more than 1 over epsilon features. OK. Is that right? In order for this? Um, so <laughs> you need, the, you need the, the original vector to have uh, 1 over epsilon. Well, yeah, so. In your original example, yeah. like the difference between the features. Yeah. So again, it depends on epsilon and delta, but yes. Okay, th this is this is more involved than it seems. We've got the statement about new, the definition of new previous slide, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I, it's all covered. So. So basically, we know that if mu, if mu is small enough, then it works. And if mu is very large, it doesn't work. But the right bound was, uh, was not known. Yes? So the other bound assumes fully random hashing? Uh, yeah. So, so, so yeah. So um, the theoretical bounds are for uh, completely random hashing. In practice, uh, it works very well with uh, much less randomness. Uh, for example, uh, mixed tabulation hashing. Um, so we have experiments. I did not include them here. Um, but, um, but it works very well with, and, and in fact, uh, 
if I already mentioned the experiments. So they show that actually the constant here is very close to 1. So the constant hiding in the theta uh, notation is very close uh, with just simple uh, mixed tabulation hashing. So you don't need the entire power of a fully uh, randomized hash function, but proving it um, is it's still elusive. So um, obviously log 1 over delta randomness is enough, but uh, I mean this all works with log 1 over delta. No more questions? Let's uh, thank you again.